welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Crystal Laser, a senior associate at Wilmer Hale in Washington, D.C. We will discuss her article, Patent Laws, Equitable Defenses, The Coming Battle of Dynamic and Traditional Interpretive Regimes, which will be published in the University of Miami Law Review, as well as her other work on patent law policy. So welcome to the show, Krista. Thank you so much for having me. Ah, the pleasure is all mine. Um, so I, I really appreciate you sending this paper along because I will confess that it's not an area of, of patent law that I really knew all that much about myself, but it's obviously one that's really um, timely and, and important. But for listeners who may not be patent law scholars or even that familiar with litigation, I wonder if you could start by just reminding people a little bit about the difference between law and equity and sort of how they relate to one another in relation to the kinds of defenses that a, a party in litigation might, might advance. Yeah, of course. So for just a brief background on law and equity, I know some folks are familiar with this, but not everybody is familiar with the background. You know, we, we used to have these separate courts of law and equity, and the law courts would typically hear issues that were from very defined legal doctrines, and the equity courts would be hearing things that were, were a little bit more within the court's discretion. And it was not always the case that the defenses that would apply in a court of equity would apply in a court of law. So for example, right now you have some doctrines like estoppel where there where there may be where there may be overlap between what's applicable in law and equity, but there are other areas of legal defenses that might not apply equally in law and equity. So for example, Unclean hands is one area where there's a defense that there is some there's some question around to what extent does does this defense which applies to conduct that is when when someone's coming into court with unclean hands and acting in a way that is um, un, unequitable does this does this bar all damages or does it bar only equitable relief so this would be things like injunctions and uh, historically, this could include actions to stop a lawsuit in law from proceeding, but that would be issued from the court of equity. So there's there's these separations between law and equity that have historically existed, although over time, there started to be some overlap where, where the equitable court started issuing orders to bar actions at law, or now when there's been this merger of law and equity under current legal systems in the US, there's there's still a question of how does this history affect how cases now should apply what were historically equitable defenses. Okay. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how that works in relation to patent law specifically. I mean, what are the sort of equitable defenses you're talking about in in patent law and and where do they come from? Yeah, so patent law has long had the, the has long given courts the ability to consider historical principles of equity when deciding issues of injunctive relief. So basically in patent law, this would be whether someone who's accused of infringing would be ordered not to continue to produce or sell the accused product. And Right now, there are issues that arise, for example, in, I'll give an example of the, the Merck case, where there was a $200 million judgment after finding that Gilead had infringed two of Merck's patents directed to treatments for hepatitis C. Um, the jury found the patents valid. And then there was a question sent to the court as to whether or not equitable remedies could, or equitable defenses could bar all remedies so would it bar the jury verdict 
or would it just bar the injunctive relief, which would block continue, um, continuations of that product or making and selling the product? And in patent law, this, this was, there are several defenses that, that come up both from this historical, this historical root of looking to, to equitable principles, but also in 1952, Congress passed the Patent Act of 1952 that included among defenses like non-infringement and invalidity, a defense of unenforceability. And the statute didn't say exactly what unenforceability means. If you look to some of the legislative history, the members of Congress indicated that they wanted this to apply as it was applied in court decisions previously. And then there was also some statements from those who were involved in drafting shortly thereafter that said this would apply to 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 estoppel and latches and unclean hands, which are areas where historically in patent cases shortly before the passage of the Patent Act, they had um, they had had these defenses towards actions uh, that were based in patent law. Nowadays, we often think of the defenses of unenforceability in patent law as including latches, estoppel, unclean hands, but also patent misuse and inequitable conduct. Some people think inequitable conduct also falls within that, although there's some debate as to whether that's really an invalidity defense or whether it's an unenforceability defense. Well, so maybe you could talk a little bit about those defenses specifically and sort of historically how they applied and sort of what the debate is today over, you know, how we should think about them in practice. Yeah, so I can walk through the history of, of each one of these in a little bit more depth. So equitable estoppel is a doctrine that historically bars recovery when a party, party seeking relief engages in misleading conduct on which the other person relies to their detriment. And we see this both in patent law and in non-patent cases. And one of the questions is to what extent should an equitable doctrine like this be used to bar um, damages as well? And in, in this case, in the case of equitable estoppel, this is something where courts of equity had used equitable estoppel to um, bar cases at law from proceeding or to prevent enforcement of judgments in cases at law prior to the merger of law and equity and prior to the 1952 Patent Act that, uh, that incorporated this among the unenforceability defenses. So equitable estoppel is one area where it is pretty consistent between patent and non-patent cases and between the historical and current practice. Now, uh, latches is another one of these unenforceability defenses. And um, this is an area where the Supreme Court recently decided in SCA hygiene that latches only applies to, um, uh, sorry, to, to actions at, at law. And so this is, um, sorry, that, um, Sorry, it's limited in actions of law, meaning that it only, and, and the interesting thing here is that they didn't base that decision, the Supreme Court didn't base that decision on a question of the historical reach of latches into actions at law. They based it on a statutory interpretation. Basically, they said that because the patent statute already has a statute of limitations in it, and latches is an equitable doctrine that's about when you wait too long for it to such that it's unfair for this case to proceed, that that statute of limitations basically provides what constitutes timeliness or untimeliness, and that there's no need to look to that equitable doctrine when you have a statute of limitations. Ultimately, there are some questions left hanging open about whether latches might result in unenforceability in other ways, like if perhaps it bars equitable remedies, such as an injunction, even if it's within the six-year statute of limitations, if that wait was unreasonable. So there are some questions left open by the SCA hygiene decision in that regard. 
And then there's what I'll call the substantive equitable defenses, unclean hands, patent misuse, and depending on how you view it, inequitable conduct. Under the doctrine of unclean hands, this prevents a party who seeks relief from a court of equity um, to obtain that relief if they come to court with unclean hands, meaning they've committed an unconscionable act that has immediate and necessary relation to the equity they seek. And this is, again, a doctrine that had been in place for long before the 1952 Patent Act and had applied in other areas of law outside of patents. This is where this gets interesting because there's a question of if this is a doctrine that has applied in both patent cases and non-patent cases historically, what does the 1952 Patent Act do to how that doctrine should be interpreted in patent law? Does this doctrine of unclean hands continue to develop through the common law or does the 1952 Patent Act, because it incorporated this doctrine, is somehow limit either the procedural scope of that doctrine, whether it applies to bar actions at law, um, or does it have any substantive limitations, such as what facts would constitute unclean hands in a patent law case? And it's, it's interesting when you look back at some of the, the history of how unclean hands was applied before the 1952 Patent Act, it was often limited to situations where there was conduct that would constitute fraud in obtaining the basis for the relief. So fraud in obtaining the patent or litigation misconduct that constituted fraud in obtaining a, ju a prior judgment. And uh, typically those are cases where that, where that unclean hands would bar legal relief even um, prior, to, prior to the merger. This is one where you could, where a court of equity could reach over into a court of law and say that they can't proceed with that judgment. Now, and this unclean hands doctrine can also have more expansive impact historically in equitable remedies to bar injunctions or in non-patent cases to bar other types of equitable relief. Um, for example, some types of equitable relief in contract law. And there's, when you try to think about, well, what does the 1952 Patent Act do to this doctrine? You have to ask yourself, what interpretive lens do you want to use? And that's where this paper goes into this competing interpretive lenses, the dynamic and the traditional approach. And uh, I, can, I can get more into that um, as we as we go on or, or jump into that now, but it's um, it's, it's essentially that the, the question of, of what does the 1952 Patent Act do to these defenses is is ultimately an interpretive question. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense to kind of to, to think about now. I mean, like what are those two different ways of of thinking about sort of interpreting common law principles in relation to to statutory codification and sort of what are the, the kind of relative rationales and kind of merits and demerits of each approach? Yeah, so under the, the there's two approaches, dynamic and what I'll call traditional. And under the dynamic approach, this is approach an approach that in its most recent form uh, was proposed by Professor William Eskridge of uh, Yale Law School, building off of some prior work of Guido Calabresi. And th under this approach, courts would be permitted to develop statutes in accordance what, with what the law ought to be. Now, Professor Esk Eskridge's approach is a bit of a moderation of Calabresi's approach because it would look first to the actual language of the statute. And if the statute is clear, then then he would leave it alone. But I think the Eskridge dynamic approach would say that if you have a statute where it's a very old statute, it's unclear, and you're trying to figure out what does this word mean, especially if the social context or the legal context has changed significantly, Eskridge would argue under the dynamic approach that you should consider 
the current social context and current needs to be more important than, than those other interpretive approaches of looking to what it is that Congress wanted at the time. And there are some, the benefits of a dynamic approach are that you can incorporate changes to law and society in the law. The, di the downside, as I'll go into more in, when discussing the traditional approach, is that it can pose some kind of constitutional problems depending on how you, how you view it. And there's also, I think, some concern that judges would have too much power in that kind of scenario and that that could cause instability in the law. And in patent law in particular, instability in the law can pose some problems for investment. So that, that's some of the pros and cons of the dynamic approach. Uh, the traditional approach is what, what's called the faithful agent approach. And this is basically a view that courts are the faithful agents of Congress that are only supposed to be interpreting Congress's um, words as they were put into the text of the statute. Now, there are multiple different interpretive methods that fall within this faithful agent approach. And different people have very different views about which are appropriate as a constitutional matter. You have textualism, you have those that consider legislative history, what Congress, what Congress meant, what, con what was essentially this, this difference between what is it that Congress said versus what is it that Congress intended. But both of those are looking to courts to be the faithful agent of Congress. So I'm bunching both of those under the traditional faithful agent approach. Now, the pros of this are that it conforms with the constitutional principles of bicameralism and presentment, where you have to have any body of law that's being passed, passed by both houses and or passed by both sides of the legislative branch and presented to the president for, for signature. And then it also it also has this it also answers this question of what, what power should courts have in our democratic system? Should the power be limited? To what extent should that be shared with other branches? And under, under a traditional approach, it would, it would limit the power of, of courts versus other branches. So in, in patent law, there can be some benefits to this approach in that there's more certainty of the law when you know exactly where the law is coming from. You don't have every judge perhaps having a different view of what the law ought to be. And there's also this question of in comparative institutional advantage. If you're trying to make policy decisions, which branch of government has the most information to make policy decisions for making law? You know, Congress has, has staffers and, and has the ability to run reports to try to determine the impact of policy, but courts don't always have that. They just have the briefs in a particular case. So there are some, some questions about which branch would have more advantages in deciding those issues. Mm -hmm. Well, so Krista, I mean, maybe you could talk more specifically about how each one of those interpretive approaches might arrive at different results in relation to patent equitable defenses and why proponents or opponents of each approach might think that it's, you know, might have opinions about which approach we ought to use in that particular context. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm going to use unclean hands as the example because that's one where there where I think there can be the biggest difference between the application of these two approaches. In unclean hands, if you look at some of the, the history of the 1952 Patent Act, um, I think I mentioned they were, they were trying to codify the existing laws. And so if you operate under a traditional faithful agent approach, you would look to the law at the time of passage of the Patent Act in 1952 to determine the reach of that, that law. Now, of course, different facts, different fact patterns can, can still fit within the scope of a doctrine as set forth in prior law, but there are certain procedural boundaries that it's really hard to say should be extended when they weren't previously extended if 
you're following a faithful agent approach and the faithful agent approach would direct you to look to the law at the time of incorporation of those words into the Patent Act. Um, one of one of the approaches under the traditional faithful agent approach in if you adopt a textualist method is that if a word has a certain meaning at common law at the time that it's incorporated into the statute, that you would look to the meaning of the word as it existed in common law at the time. Um, so that's one way in which the faithful agent approach would look to kind of what is the law in 1952. And then alternatively, if you take the approach of looking to legislative history, which is not typically done in the in the more modern approaches uh, to the, the faithful agent approach, the Supreme Court typically does not look to legislative history as much as it used to. But if you if you adopted that method, then then the legislative history here again indicates that the 1952 Patent Act would incorporate the doctrine as it existed at the time. So essentially the biggest difference here is whether it extends into actions of law, because at the time of the 1952 Patent Act, there were only these very narrow circumstances under which unclean hands would bar actions at law, namely in fraud and obtaining the basis for relief, fraud and obtaining the patent. So this is a kind of similar to what people are now viewing as inequitable conduct, although I, I don't, don't personally think that this is where inequitable conduct comes from as a historical matter, um, but it's similar to the idea that if you if you have fraud in obtaining the patent, that you shouldn't be able to enforce it, um, or fraud in obtaining the judgment. So if you had perjury during your per, if you perjured yourself during your deposition or destroyed documents or something like that that resulted in you obtaining a judgment and then and then ultimately ultimately you're not equitably entitled to that judgment because you obtained that from fraud, then that's something that unclean hands would also bar. So there's these two sides of the coin, fraud and obtaining the patent and severe litigation or business misconduct sometimes. And in under a um, traditional approach, this there are certain types of conduct that might be considered unclean hands for barring equitable relief, that wouldn't be considered unclean hands for barring legal relief. So this might be, for example, if, um, if, if, you, if there's certain business misconduct, and I, I guess I, I'm cautious to provide specifics just because I don't want to, given, given my firm's obligations to clients, don't want to run into anything with, um, with client concerns, but, this, but essentially this is, if somebody were to argue that something other than fraud would constitute unclean hands. So there are, there are some people saying um, that that obtaining, you know, obtaining and prosecuting patents in a certain way could constitute unclean hands or or other types of conduct like that that doesn't quite arise to fraud, but but might be considered business misconduct and and perhaps unconscionable business misconduct. So in the, in the traditional approach, um, this kind of conduct might not be, might, might not be extended to, to bar damages. You wouldn't have that, that you know, $200 million damages verdict get knocked out for that. Under a dynamic approach, the courts would say, what, what should the law be? Is this conduct that is so unconscionable that we should not permit patentees to be able to enforce their patent to take advantage of a government granted right to obtain remedies from other people when they're engaging in serious misconduct. And under the dynamic approach, a court might say this type of, this type of conduct is not in conformity with current social and legal norms, and there has to be a way to stop it. And preventing enforcement of this patent is the way to stop it. So that the dynamic approach would give the courts that kind of flexibility to try to determine what is appropriate in that particular case, what is appropriate given the norms of society at, right now. Mm. Well, it seems especially appropriate in this uh, time of pandemic, as it were. I mean, I know people have already been talking about how we should think about potential patent claims in relation to say vaccines and various other kinds of kind of pharmaceutical 
uh, innovation in relation to the coronavirus. And I imagine that these questions could be really salient going forward, especially insofar as it sounds like, you know, it sounds really technical, but could have a really profound impact on whether patent owners are able to proceed on claims at all. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. And this this is one area where this difference between the dynamic and traditional approach will have a huge impact on how those cases are decided. It will basically make the difference between does it make sense for a patentee to bring that case or not? You know, there's some I, there's some talk in the news of of people bringing patent enforcement actions against developers of coronavirus vaccines, and I, I do think it's it's possible that there will be a question of, does this conduct fit within the current social norms of what is of what should be of what should be appropriate as a as a basis for enforcing patents? And a question of does this conduct fall within the doctrines that they existed at the time of statutory incorporation? Um, and and I think that this can make a difference between whether you bring the claim, because if you can't get damages for that conduct, then there's less incentive to pursue the claim. Now, of course, it you can there can be settlement pressure around these cases or pressure to get a license if the patentee is able to show that they would be able to get an injunction. And if a defense of unclean hands or patent misuse perhaps would prevent the patentee from obtaining an injunction, then that can also mean that they won't want to bring the case because there won't be that settlement or licensing pressure, even if perhaps they could obtain some amount of damages. Mm. Well, so one question I had reading reading your paper was whether Congress, in enacting a statute, could explicitly or maybe even implicitly like choose which interpretive approach it wants courts to use. In other words, can like Congress opt in to a dynamic approach to interpreting a statute, or is that like not an option, as it were? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And this again comes back to some constitutional principles, one of which is the non-delegation doctrine. And um, the the question under the non-delegation doctrine is, is Congress authorized to give that lawmaking authority to other branches of government? And there's significant debate around this. I know people have very strong views about what's constitutionally appropriate. Under the current Supreme Court approach, um, typically that delegation can be done if there is sufficiently clear guidance provided by um, the provided by the language of the statute to enable the entity or or typically an agency to which that decision making is delegated to to determine how to make that those guidelines. So, for example. In the copyright bill, which you're which you're familiar with, they they have this, they have um, a, the ability for setting out an agency to set out what kind of conduct would constitute um, an exception to um, tech, a, a circumvention of technological access measures. So basically, whether whether um, that whether messing with the technology is copyright infringement or, or, a, or sorry, a, a violation of the statute. And Congress has delegated um, the ability to set forth every three years particular exceptions to this rule to account for changes in technological or societal needs. Under an analogous approach, if Congress wanted to enable the considerations or elements of um, the law to change over time in this in this unclean hands or the patent misuse context, they could potentially delegate that to an agency or to courts to say, um, so for example, if this were delegated to courts, it might say, um, 
here are the standards under which uh, something would be unclean hands. You know, is it is it unconscionable according to current societal mores or something like that? And if and and then could say it is within the discretion of the courts um, to determine whether that conduct is um, is un, is unconscionable. And I I think that there there are ways for Congress to to make that more explicit. Um, you have, for example, in the in the antitrust context with the um, that that is one where Congress has provided, and and again, there's some debate as to the, as to whether this is uh, whether the amount of guidance they provide in that statute is is sufficient to satisfy um, the non delegation doctrine. But I think most people would think that that Congress sufficiently delegated to courts the ability to determine what type of conduct is anti competitive. Um, alternatively, there are ways for Congress to delegate this kind of decision making to an agency. For example, the Federal Trade Commission could be tasked with setting forth a list of what kind of uses of a patent would be contrary to the public interest. Um, and there, or there might be, for example, a delegation to the Patent Office to set forth what standards constitute fraud in obtaining a patent. So there are different ways in which Congress could delegate this, either to courts or to agencies. And I think making it more explicit in the statute would be very helpful to try to determine exactly exactly what should happen. Because if you make it more explicit in the statute, then even under a traditional agent approach, it's saying, well, even if courts are acting as the faithful agent, Congress tells us to use our discretion in a certain way. So there are ways in which this could be a lot more specific than it than it currently is in the statute, where there's just one word that that says there shall be a defense of unenforceability. So, Krista, I got to say, I mean, I, there was one question that was sort of in the back of my mind in relation to especially a lot of the arguments that are made from the kind of traditional interpretive approach side, which is this kind of assumption that Congress is sort of studiously considering these different options and making considered policy decisions about which approach to take and so on and so forth. I, I mean, is that is that reality? And to what extent does the traditional approach really need Congress to engage in that kind of kind of careful policy weighing? Or is that just a kind of a fiction, in your opinion, that we use in order to, to sort of explain why we would take one approach versus another. In other words, I, mean, I guess my question kind of is, like, is the virtue of the traditional approach predictability or is the virtue of, traditional, of the traditional approach more about sort of fealty to these separation of powers issues? Or is there like maybe different strokes for different folks as it were? Yeah, that's a great question. And it really comes down to the, the crux of the issue in this article which is, is it really fair? Is it really fair to say that Congress made a determination of this? And I think that's why this issue, the equitable defenses, is an ideal issue to consider which approach is relevant because it's one of those issues where it's clear that Congress didn't really think through every detail that could happen here. Congress didn't think through and, and could have had no way in 1952 of thinking through the ways in which patents are used today and the ways in which patents are are purchased and assigned and, and or you know a, vi a viral outbreak and what happens if if you don't what happens if you don't um, license during a viral outbreak or something like that and these are these are questions that that the statutory text through one word could never, fully answer. So there are compelling justifications on both sides to say under a dynamic approach, Congress did not consider this because they didn't. Under a traditional approach though, as you said, there are these certainty elements that this is more, this is more about what should be the process for ensuring that we have a deliberative and predictable law. 
And if everyone kind of agrees upon what methods should be used for interpreting the law and where, where we should gather insight as to how to determine the law, then that can create more predictability of the law. So under, and, and then I think there's also this question, as you said, about separation of powers and under the constitution, is it really appropriate for, for courts to be the one doing that kind of policy making, um, even if Congress didn't do the policy making fully in the first place. I think the, I think for example, Scalia in his book, Reading Law has this view and not everybody agrees with this, but it's one view that supports the traditional approach, which is that if you want to have certainty of the law, um, there can be there can be defects in 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 what happens when you interpret the law according to this approach. But that doesn't mean that the approach is invalid. It means that Congress needs to go back and and do it again if they disagree with the outcome of what the law would be under that interpretive method. So there's there's definitely uh, pluses and minuses under both approaches, and there's certainly a a practical consideration and under the dynamic approach of Congress didn't consider this and, and courts are the ones that are exposed to all these nitty gritty facts that Congress couldn't, couldn't legislate around every fact. Um, but I think, I think under a traditional approach, you would say, look, Congress can set forth standards and there are many ways to do that. One of which is by imputed common law looking to the meaning of a word as it existed at the time. And that it's a choice that Congress makes to use a word that existed at a particular time. And under the traditional agent approach, courts would respect that, that decision, if only for the certainty of law and consistency of legal interpretation. But again, there are, there are considerations both sides. And that's why this equitable defenses is such a good battleground to look at this issue. Okay. Yeah. I love that. Thanks. That That's really helpful actually. Uh, so, so Krista, in closing, I know, just give me a second here. There's a very noisy car going by. Um, so Krista, in, in closing, I know you have a new paper that you wrote with judge Arthur J. Gaiarsa. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and the work that you're doing on kind of thinking about the Supreme Court's approach to certiorari and patent cases. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak about this as well. And I'll, I'll just make a little pitch that this article, this certiorari article is still looking for a home and I've sent it out. So to any of you law review, the editors who've, who might've seen it cross your desk, please take a look at it. Uh, this, this article is essentially about why the Supreme Court has increased what appears to have been an increase in interest in patent law in the recent decades. The Supreme Court's decided more patent law cases in the last decade than it has in the prior three decades combined. And it looks like we have like we have this increased interest in patent law from the Supreme Court. We wanted to figure out what drives that. So we looked at some of the statistics around the increase. We also did structured interviews with clerks and others who are very familiar with the certiorari process at the Supreme Court, like people formerly in the solicitor's office and um, current Supreme Court advocates. But we primarily report on former clerks. And we realized that there are a lot of considerations in patent cases that the Supreme Court has to use because there's no other proxy like there are in, in cases where there's a circuit split at the federal circuit because they have exclusive jurisdiction over patent cases, there's very rarely a circuit split. And in most cases, that's the, the circuit split is the general driver of Supreme Court decision-making as to whether to grant cert. So they have to look to other considerations. And one of the most interesting things that we found is that it doesn't seem to be that there's this increasing interest in patent law. It almost seems to be a bit of an accident that patent law cases are increasing at the Supreme Court lately. And part of that is that 
people who, who work on these cases are very skilled at getting amicus support, solicitor general support. And, um, but also because there's been all this increased ideological division at the court in recent years, patent cases are viewed as safe. And, and there may be some indication that, that these cases are being heard, that patent cases are being heard more often because other cases are being heard less often. And so one of the things that we, we talk about in this paper is that this can cause a lot of instability in patent law. There are, there are areas where we really need Supreme Court intervention, like in my past paper where I was with equities, where I'm saying that we really need the Supreme Court to tell us what to do with equitable defenses because they haven't looked at it in 70 years. But there are many other types of areas where the Supreme Court has just been issuing decision after decision after decision. You know, we look at the context of uh, 101 case law, which is statutory eligible subject matter. And there are many people that, that think that the Supreme Court's approach to this and the number of decisions has caused a lot of instability in the law. Um, so ultimately we recommend in this paper that, ultimately we recommend in this paper that the Supreme Court should consider the impact of taking cert on the stability of law. Because there's no circuit split to figure out whether they should take the case, they need to look to other factors like the public interest and whether they really need to hear a case on this issue. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it looks like a great paper, and I'm looking forward to reading it myself. And Krista, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciated talking to you, and I think this is a really timely paper. And I encourage law review editors to pick up your new one, which sounds fantastic. I can't thank you enough for having me on, and I really appreciate all the thoughtful questions that you had. Mother necessity with her good intentions. Where would this country be without her inventions? Oh, things were rotten in the land of cotton. Till Whitney made the cotton gin Now old times there will soon be forgotten For it did the work of a hundred men Mother necessity, where would we be? Mother Edison worked late each night It went well until the fading light Little Thomas Alva Edison said I'll grow up to be a great inventor And I'll make a lamp to help my mommy see Wowee, what an excellent application of electricity. He worked hard and pulled a switch. He was smart and very rich. Mother necessity, help us to see. Now the mother of Samuel Morse always sent the lad out on a horse. Whoopie, whoopie, Take a message to Miss Peavy on the far side of the pike. Spread the word about the quilting being excited. Little Samuel started thinking of a way to send a message Though he'd never met a horse he didn't like <laughs> Mother Necessity Elias, can you help me with my sewing? Mother dear, I'll fulfill your fondest wishes Elias, how? This machine I've made will keep your sewing really flowing In fact, we'll keep the whole nation in stitches Ah, Mother Necessity, where would we be? Bring me Augie Alexander Graham Bell Thank you, Alexander, for the phone I'd never get a date, I'd never get a job Unless I had a telephone Mother Necessity Hold the ill Wilbur, go and now continue with your silly playing Take these players and take those blueprints Take that funny look at the thing Take that wheel and take that wing I can't hear a thing that Mrs. Jones is saying Oh, the Wilbur, the next morning When Marconi gave us wireless radio When Henry Ford cranked up his first dollar bow When Samuel Slater showed us how the factories go When Robbie Iron and Ollie Paul and Steel and Yankee, don't you know that They made this country really grow, grow